It was the biggest airborne assault in history. 40,000 men would descend on occupied Holland in a bid to end the war by Christmas. Leading the vanguard, Major General Roy Urquhart, a favorite of Montgomery, newly promoted. And when the mission hit trouble, the general would have to dive headlong into the battle to save his men. Dodging German sniper fire, he'd become trapped in a lethal game of cat and mouse. To rescue his troops, he would have to escape himself in one of the most savage battles of the war. And then escape again, leading 2,000 shattered men out of the tightening grip of German forces. In September 1944, everyone thought Hitler was finished. D-Day and the Normandy campaign had been hugely successful. Now, the big question was how to press home the advantage and take the war into Germany and Berlin. But success had brought with it its own problems. Intense rivalry and bitter animosity between Field Marshal Montgomery and the American General George Patton made the Allies' plans on what to do next highly political. What you have is the development of two conflicting plans. One essentially that's American, the broad front strategy. The Allies should actually push forward along a broad front, uh, try and wear down the Germans. The competing plan is the narrow front strategy extolled by Monty. It says that what the Allies should do is concentrate their forces and attack Germany in its heart, but from a point that it wouldn't really expect. Montgomery lobbied the Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight Eisenhower, and argued hard for his strategy to be chosen. He claimed he could send a strike force that would skirt northwards across German-occupied Holland and around the German defensive wall called the Siegfried Line. First, airborne troops would seize and hold key bridges over several of Holland's many waterways. The last, the crossing over the mighty river Rhine in the town of Arnhem. With the bridges held, a vast army called 30 Corps would dash through Holland along a narrow road in an invasion that would sweep into the plains of northern Germany. It was breathtaking in its ambition and its elegance. If it worked, a massive invading force could be in Germany's backyard in days. And Montgomery would take the prize of Berlin ending the war by Christmas. Eisenhower gave Montgomery the green light. All eyes were on the gateway to victory, Arnhem. A Dutch town hard on the German border, its bridge over the River Rhine would be the key to success and the toughest of the mission. Deep behind enemy lines, it would be the furthest to take the last to be crossed, and the longest to be held. Determined to seize it, the 12,000-strong British 1st Airborne Division, among the fiercest fighting men in the British Army. Leading them, Major General Roy Urquhart. Monty was very good at spotting talent. So in the case of Urquhart, he saw him as a man who was capable, who was very good under pressure, could think independently, was very good at gaining the respect and trust of his men. These were all qualities that you would actually need if you were going to lead an airborne division into combat. Although Urquhart had no experience commanding airborne troops, he was well known as a fierce warrior in battle. Leading his men into Sicily, he'd already shown great daring and physical courage. But his promotion meant an altogether different kind of soldiering. As divisional commander, Urquhart's job was not to fight, but to take a step back, use his brains, not his muscle. 
This time, he'd have to lead his men from a war room in a divisional headquarters, thinking tactically about the battle and how best to deploy his forces, all the while keeping a cool head. Success at Arnhem could be the first rung on the ladder of truly great things as a career general and a chance to shine as the star who led Monty to Berlin. On September 17, the word was given that Operation Market was on and the Airborne Army prepared to go into action. The great Allied Air Fleet, which was to deliver more than 39,000 men on this operation, 11,000 of them to Arnhem. Now, the massive Airborne Army mustered for action with the bridges of Holland in its sights. Fifteen hundred airplanes and three thousand gliders would carry thirty-seven thousand British and American men, seventeen hundred vehicles and three thousand tons of ammunition. At first, Urquhart's men were cynical about the mission. Sixteen times since D-Day, they'd been primed for action, only to have each operation called off. So when the call came again, few were certain they'd be fighting soon. Everybody was still in a pessimistic mood that it would again be cancelled at the last minute. In fact, they were still betting on it the very next morning. My father felt that his own parachute troops were getting what he called, um, were, were battle-hungry, and that they were going off the boil almost. They were becoming cynical, almost gung-ho about things. And actually, several of the parachute people I've talked to said, you know, we'd have gone whatever, we'd have let, jumped on Berlin if, if that had required that. Everyone reckoned that it was the same old thing. But this time, you could see hundreds of planes already beginning to load up. This was it. Finally, the paratroops were airborne. Elite soldiers drawn from the best units of the British infantry. The hour they had been preparing for for months was upon them. When all the aircraft and gliders took off, on the first day, the sky was just completely black. And people, you know, who were children at the time, never forgot the sight. Their expertise was in quick-moving, surprise assaults behind enemy lines. For this, they could only be lightly armed. They would drop with only the weapons and armor that could be carried in prop planes towing plywood gliders. It would be the flimsiest of arsenals wielded by the toughest men. On paper, the mission was simple to take a bridge in a surprise attack behind enemy lines with great speed, then to hold it for two days while the land invasion of 30 Corps caught up. But before the general arrived on Dutch soil, he knew the obstacles to be overcome were daunting. This would be no ordinary battle. Taking and holding the bridge at Arnhem was hard enough, but the plan presented his men with some extraordinary challenges. And as they looked down on the dikes and fields of Holland, the first obstacle in the mission dawned. They would not be landing close to their target. Instead, they'd land miles to the west, then march through enemy territory to get to the bridge for the surprise attack. And somehow, they would have to do this undetected. It's all about surprise, it's all about getting to the bridge. That's going to put you at a disadvantage straight away. Urquhart knows this. He's aware of the disadvantages of the plan, but he's basically told by his commander, Browning, that's what you've got. You've got to get on with it. Already, Urquhart was dealing with a fragile plan. It could work, but his lightly armed force would have to be relieved very quickly. 
Once it had taken the bridge, the 50,000 men and tanks of 30 Corps would have to be coming over the horizon within hours. Once you drop an airborne paratrooper, they drop with three days of supplies. So three days of food, three days of ammunition. They have very little in the way of armor, of artillery or anti-tank. They basically have to land, take their position and hold until they're relieved by troops more better equipped for that kind of uh, operation. Three days, so that's what they have, three days. At 2 p.m. on Sunday the 17th of September, as the first paratroops and gliders touched down on Dutch soil, the plan went live. Speed was now of the essence. Under clear skies, the first hours of Operation Market went exactly to plan, and the great airborne army organized itself for action on the ground. As the maneuvers that had been rehearsed countless times unfolded, Officers and men were encouraged by the expectation that they would meet light German resistance. It's a plan that can't withstand any negative impact on it. If the Germans make any serious attempt to resist the Allied operation, it has the potential to unravel because timings are so critical. It's a great plan, but as, uh, as the Polish commander, General Sosabowski, said, what about the Germans? Completely unknown to the men marching into Arnhem, stationed three miles away was one of the fiercest and most lethal tank divisions in the entire German army, and it was now speeding towards them. It will be backed up by crack SS troops, hardened by years on the Russian front. And finally, there were expert and seasoned German paratroop commanders who knew exactly how to destroy an airborne attack. These were not the old men and young boys Urquhart had been told to expect. And this was just the beginning. For Urquhart, almost immediately, serious problems reared up on his first day as divisional commander. Control of his troops spreading through the suburbs of Arnhem rested entirely on effective radio communication. And within hours of landing, the radios stop working. For a commander, this is critical because it means he has no visibility in terms of what's going on. The radio allows you to interface with your eyes and ears because your eyes and ears are the brigadiers, brigade commanders, uh, even the company commanders. And, and I think sort of more or less straight away during that first day and certainly going into the next, this is when he starts to become uncomfortable. And at first, everything seemed to be going well. Two units from the 1st Parachute Brigade marched rapidly to Arnhem and quickly dispatched what little resistance they met. This was exactly what had been expected, and as the paras pressed on, pride and confidence rippled through the columns. Urquhart even had his first prisoners of war who were paraded for newsreel audiences. And Dutch locals, delighted by their liberation, came out to greet their conquering heroes. But it was not to last. German resistance was now rapidly organizing, and an advance party of Paris speeding to the bridge by jeep was wiped out. Expecting no opposition, the British were now taking serious casualties. The furious rush to get to Arnhem Bridge intensified. But without radio communication, organization and leadership began to disintegrate. As German forces quickly took up positions to stop the advance, the Paras found themselves fighting blindly in dense woodland and narrow back streets, breaking up into small units, each clueless 
about what lay ahead. It was every general's nightmare. Information blackout, leading to total chaos. The advance began to slow. Urquhart's battlefield instincts now took over. Never one to keep his distance from the front line, the general decided it was time to seize control and lead from the front. One of the things that really goes wrong, he is a soldier's soldier. He fights, he leads from the front. And if he doesn't know what's going on, he's going to find out what's going on. And this is what leads him to make this fateful decision to go forward. Urquhart did what a divisional commander should never do and dived into enemy territory. Jumping into his jeep, he went in search of his subordinates, determined to urge speed and press them to accelerate towards the bridge. It would be a fatal error. For as he swept ahead, leaving his headquarters behind, the Germans closed in behind him. In the thick of the action, he charged on, not realizing that by becoming cut off from his command post, he had deprived his army of its leader. Before long, he encountered a young British officer marching a unit of men towards the bridge, Major Tony Hibbert. A jeep came up from behind, and in it, I was amazed to see General Urquhart. This was definitely Indian territory with Germans all over the place, and to just to have your commander with no protection seemed to be odd. And he stood up in the back of his jeep and said, Hibbert, for Christ's sake, get your bloody brigade moving faster, or the German tanks will be on the bridge before you. And I said, yes, sir. Then he disappeared. And of course, as history shows, he disappeared for, I think, another two days, which left the operation without a leader for a very important period. Next, Urquhart caught up with his most senior officer, but now had to advance into Arnhem a passenger, unable to command and unable to return. But even so, by evening, he seemed to have had a breakthrough. The first paras were on the bridge at Arnhem. A battalion led by the legendary commander, Colonel John Frost, now held the north approach, and they waited for the other paras to join them. With Frost was the young Major Tony Hibbert, in charge of the brigade headquarters and responsible for communications. By 10 o'clock, the second battalion had got 350 men and set up a defensive position on the north end of the bridge, about 500 yards by 500 yards. Through that first night, the remaining paratroops made slow progress along the streets of Arnhem as they fought to join Frost and Hibbert's men on the bridge. Urquhart, meanwhile, had turned a Dutch house into a temporary HQ, planning to continue at first light. At the bridge, that Sunday night passed quietly. Frost and Hibbert's men, knowing that 30 Corps would soon be with them, waited for dawn full of confidence. Six o'clock next morning, suddenly there was an enormous artillery barrage. Then we heard the tanks uh, revving up. And actually, we thought there was just a chance that maybe our own troops had got a little bit ahead of schedule and that it was them. Everyone had been standing up, waving their red berries, 
until we could actually see the crosses on the tank and <laughs> dive for cover. Now the lightly armed Paris faced an adversary they could never have prepared for. The armor of the elite and massively well-equipped 9th SS Panzer Division, among the most dangerous units in the German army. We had four six-pounder anti-tank guns, and they were fantastically accurate. I think it was all over in three quarters of an hour, and at the end of it, all these armored cars and tanks, they were all hugga on fire. <laughs> they said <it's> factory. <laughs> Incredibly, and against all odds, the Paris had fought off the German tank assault. It would be the high point of the first day, and optimism surged at the bridge. But as Frost and his men congratulated themselves, the full consequences of Urquhart's decision to charge ahead and get cut off from his HQ became clear. For in the streets of Arnhem, German forces were now swarming. Heavily armed and often highly trained, they were turning into an insuperable obstacle, dividing the men on the bridge from the rest of Urquhart's troops. This is an extremely intense battle. This is urban fighting, just about the worst kind of experience that a soldier will have to face. Fighting in a built-up area, not knowing what's around the corner, watching as your, your mates, your friends, your, your colleagues are injured, wounded, killed, running out of ammunition, running out of food, running out of water. And as the commander, you obviously want to try and minimise their exposure to that. You want to use them to best effect. And Urquhart can't do this because he doesn't know what's going on. He simply has no idea. Any hope that Urquhart could return to his command post was out of the question. With only a pistol to fight with, all he could do was stick with his men, now scurrying through back streets, dodging snipers and clambering over garden fences. No one had any idea where he was, and he was given up for dead. There's nobody coming for Urquhart. By this stage, British command had moved on. Urquhart's gone, could be dead, could be wounded, could be captured, who knows? There was no rescue party sent for him. They don't know where he is. With no clear instructions on Urquhart's succession, a power struggle broke out among his deputies, each claiming superiority. The British invasion force, with no communications internally or with the outside world, was now effectively leaderless. Urquhart and two junior officers were now taking refuge from the sniper fire in the attic of a Dutch house. As they hid, a German tank took up a position outside. They were trapped. It would be a long wait, and the general could only contemplate how his big break to run a high-profile operation was going. Doug Charlton was among the men still trying to relieve Colonel Frost and his men at the bridge. Advancing along a high embankment on one side of the River Rhine and armed only lightly, Charlton and his comrades would soon find out just what kind of opposition they were dealing with. We were met by uh, anti-aircraft guns firing at chest high from across the river. The shells were thudding into the embankment to our left. There was no room for manoeuvre at all. The only way was forward. Scrambling for cover, the Paras quickly found themselves outgunned. What was left of the battalion was very few, about 15, 20. Set up defensive positions in, in three houses, about seven to 7.30 a.m., the Germans came with tanks and armor, Tiger tanks firing at point-blank range through the houses. 
which gradually fell to pieces. There's no defense against that sort of thing. Machine guns covering every exit. Overwhelmed by massively superior firepower, there was nothing for Doug and his comrades to do but surrender. Meanwhile, in its general's absence, the British invasion of Arnhem had degenerated into a mass of small units moving haphazardly in radio silence against a well-organized and much more powerful force. And its leader, the divisional commander, Major General Roy Urquhart, was powerless to help them. He kept on wanting to escape. But because there were three of them, they had to take a majority vote. And these other two junior officers thought, well, um, you know, this is suicide mission. So they wouldn't let him do that. So he, he was really forced. And they said, look, our, our troops will catch up with us. Um, the main body will catch, because it's in the plan, they'll get by um, tomorrow morning. So it's much better just to wait here until they, they come. Eventually, a chance movement of the battle around him gave the general the opening he had been waiting for. With no idea of what to expect, he made a dash for it. Essentially, he waits for an opportunity when it's clear that there's some sort of battle going on in the street below. And as he comes out of the house, one can only imagine prepared for any eventuality. It happens that it is elements of his own troops that are moving forward. He comes out, his troops are there, double take. Ah, General, uh, everybody's been looking for you. Um, transport's found for him immediately, jumps in the transport, and he's off. And he heads back to his headquarters. General was at last back at his headquarters in the village of Osterbeck. The bridge was just two miles away, but it might as well have been a hundred. For the whole of the first full day of battle, Urquhart had been away from his command, and his invasion was disintegrating. By now, the battle to reach the bridge had ground down into a slaughter, pitting paratroops prepared only for light opposition against a fully equipped German force. Urquhart rallied his troops and convinced them that all was not yet lost. If they could only hold on for a while longer, then reinforcements from 30 Corps would surely arrive. Then, to his immense relief, his almost useless radios briefly crackled into life. They brought some truly exciting news from Arnhem's neighboring town of Nijmegen, just 10 miles away. communications starts to improve a little bit. And from these, he's told that the British force is in Nijmegen. So it's reached Nijmegen. So for Urquhart, this is an opportunity to tell the men this can still be done. He gives a little speech. Try and shore up morale just to sort of say, well, look, all that we've given, everything we've sacrificed, it's still possible. Back at the bridge, the Germans had changed tactics. With the tank assault repulsed, they switched to artillery. They demolished houses occupied by Frost and Hibbert's men with both high explosives and phosphorus shells. Their first target was the school building occupied by Tony Hibbert and his men, which had a field hospital in the cellar. They started to pound the whole of our position um, on both sides of the road, and that went on for 36 hours. Brigade headquarters had the field ambulance in the cellars. By the third day, we had just on 300 men in the cellars, and, of course, there had been no water uh, since the first day. 
and we'd run out of old field dressings and so forth. Most of the buildings had been <laughs> broken down into small bits, and then they switched to phosphorus shells. There was nothing to put out the flames with, which created a problem for us, because there was no water. We'd run out of water. Major Hibbert knew he had to act to save his wounded men from being burnt alive in the cellar. With minutes to spare, he turned to his enemy for help, unsure of what compassion he could expect. At 10 o'clock on Wednesday, the fires in Brigade headquarters uh, went out of control. And of course, we had all these people in the, in the um, cellar. So we asked the Germans for a two-hour ceasefire to enable us to get our men out of the cellars before they were burned. The Germans were very good, and they sent quite a lot of men of their own men to help. And it was a close run thing, but eventually we got everyone out before the flames got them. Meanwhile, the few remaining men of Doug Charlton's battalion were now in the hands of the Waffen-SS. Months in a prisoner of war camp loomed ahead. But before being marched off to Germany, Doug was allowed to take his wounded comrades to the town's hospital. In the chaos of the battle, few paid attention to the exhausted POWs. They took the wounded in, and um, it was just, everybody was just standing around. There was much confusion, as you can understand, with the battle going on all around. The German soldiers then became distracted by the British supply drops falling into their territory. Doug saw a golden opportunity and took full advantage. They were smoking English cigarettes and eating Cadbury's chocolate and were rubbing their hands in glee at the resupply drop. More goodies for us because they kept saying, not for you, Tommy. Uh, it was for them. You get one chance to make the right decision, one window of opportunity. And I just wandered off. The Paras were now coming to the end of their third day and were almost out of ammunition. Any hope of fighting through the blisteringly strong German lines to join the unit on the bridge had completely faded. The general now pulled his remaining force of some three and a half thousand men into a mile square defensive pocket enclosing Osterbeck and prepared to hold off the Germans now encircling him. The pocket would be his redoubt, and with its perimeter held by paras in trenches and houses, Urquhart reviewed his options. It was clear that his men would never make it through to the bridge. Frost and Hibbert's troops would have to be abandoned. But rather than let his divisional command end in total failure, Urquhart came up with a new plan. He sent a message to his superiors, suggesting 30 corps divert from their planned target of Arnhem Bridge and head towards a point on the south bank opposite him. Then, he suggested 30 corps could build a bridge and cross into the defensive pocket. It was a bold plan. 30 corps, after all, have been traveling with all these vehicles all full of bridging equipment, all designed specifically to cross waterways. So if you can hold the north bank of the river and they come up and they can capture the south bank, then perhaps you can still put a bridge across. And if you can put a bridge across, then maybe the plan can carry on to hold this pocket, to hold this bridgehead and build the bridge. But unknown to the general and his men, 30 Corps were hopelessly behind schedule and had become bogged down in bitter fighting. The relief of Arnhem would have to wait even longer. Meanwhile, back at the bridge, 
Fires engulfed the headquarters of Frost and Hibbert's beleaguered battalion. With artillery raining down, it was clear they could hold on no longer. Major Hibbert split his men into small bands and had them attempt to sneak through the German infantry lines, but they were quickly captured. They had got about uh, 80 or 90 of us, and they were moving them back to Germany in open lorries, each one taking about 30 of our men. But Major Hibbert and his men were trained not to regard capture as the end of the war and make escape a duty. I'd been an intelligence officer, and I used to give lectures to all the troops um, on what to do if, uh, if you're captured. And I said, your first duty is to get away. And the easiest time to get away is the first 48 hours you will find yourself in a position where suddenly someone's not looking. That opportunity was soon to present itself. But the biggest challenge was the moving lorries. Hibbert and his comrades had to make them stop long enough so a jump for freedom would be possible. For the first 10 yards of getting up speed, it was the, you could actually jump off the lorry. So we worked up this plan. We'd irritate the Germans sufficiently that they would come and stop and, and, and warn us. So as our van went through the town, we started giving the, the V sign to um, the Dutch to cheer them up, and which they replied to, and this infuriated German guard, a young corporal of about 70, who had a schmeiser. He, this infuriated him, so he stopped twice and said, if you do this again, I will shoot. Anyhow, we stopped a third time and uh, had arranged with one of the other officers. We both jumped off and uh, he jumped a wall and I jumped the other side and I managed to get away and joined the uh, Dutch resistance. But Major Hibbert's bid for freedom came at a price. The corporal put her ma magazine in his schmeiser and shot six of our chaps dead. And um, uh, it, well, from my point of view, it is the worst thing that happened to me. I, I was solely responsible, and uh, that was it. Urquhart and his men at the Osterbeck pocket were now desperately short of food, ammunition, and medicine. With no radio contact and under orders to ignore ground signals, pilots bringing drops of new supplies stuck to the prearranged drop zones, almost always now held by the enemy. Uh, the men on the ground, they try their hardest, they try and rig up some sort of signalling mechanisms, but these have very little success. It means that they have very little in the way of ammunition. Uh, it means that they have very little in the way of food. Uh, Urquhart himself says that actually he didn't realise that he probably didn't eat for the best part of six days. By now, Doug Charlton had made his way to the perimeter and rejoined Urquhart's force. He soon found himself in the thick of the action. The attacks were continuing all the time. Never were for mortars, which fired six bombs at once. And those daily bombardments continued twice a day for another four and a half days. All interspersed by probing infantry attacks, supported by tanks. But the perimeter held anyway. But 
caused a lot of damage. The casualties were mounting up all the time. As Doug Charlton fought on in the trenches, his comrades fell about him. Overloaded dressing stations acted as a constant reminder of what he could expect if he got hit. The old vicarage was used as a medical dressing station. It was filled to overflowing. There was uh, lots of dead bodies in the garden. The bombardments had disrupted the water mains and there was no water. The only water available was from the well in the vicarage garden. And the German snipers concentrated their efforts on that sort of thing. The Paras had now been holding out for over a week, far longer than the plan had originally envisaged, and longer than they had been equipped for. The Germans have worked out what's going on. They've worked out that essentially they have defeated the British force that's landed. Um, now it's a question of time and slowly squeezing them in and essentially um, street, street, um, street fighting, uh, house to house fighting. The Germans moved towards a system of essentially using their superior firepower, using their tanks and their artillery to flatten the buildings progressively to force the troops back into a point where they are either destroyed entirely or they surrender. As German reinforcements built up around them, the Paras were besieged, fighting a hopeless battle with no end in sight. Urquhart still clung to the hope that his proposal for 30 Corps to build a bridge across the Rhine would get approval. But at 6 a.m. on Monday morning, an order came confirming his worst fears. The mission was to be aborted. 30 Corps would not be coming. Roy Urquhart now faced the awful realization that his first divisional command could only end in failure. Urquhart is very upset about the decision. He knows the enormity of what's gone on, that this division has gone in and fought so gallantly for such an extended period, with very little in the way of resupply, uh, with very little in the way of information or even hope. But now, having done all of that, it's going to be for naught. The men around Urquhart knew now that they were alone and completely surrounded. There was no way out through the encircling Germans. Escape would be suicidal. The options were bleak. And then, the unimaginable happened. Without warning, British artillery shells exploded all around, crushing the enemy positions. 30 Corps' mission may have been aborted, but they were still close enough to help. British artillery that has now reached Nijmegen is called into effect from the Nijmegen area to support the pocket and proves incredibly successful. Without any spotters on the ground, without anybody to give them absolute coordinates, they're able to bring in this fire from 10, 11 kilometers away, and it helps keep the pocket going. And it's that actually in the end which will be crucial in allowing the escape to take place. Urquhart sees this his only chance. Something at least could be salvaged from his disastrous first command. He could get his 2,000 most able-bodied men to safety. So he came up with Operation Berlin, a plan to sneak his men across the Rhine under the cover of darkness. Unfortunately, it meant leaving the most severely injured behind. A message came through that we were being withdrawn over the river. That night, I was detailed to help the Padre with the evacuation of the walking wounded. He'd already selected the people who, who he thought could make the journey down to the river. Operation Berlin 
was Urquhart at his best, improvising, thinking on his feet in the heat of battle. He was a sort of independent person. He just liked operating on his own, only having to consult his staff. At the beginning, when he was following other people's plans, that's when everything went wrong. And at the end, when he was on his own and he had to just sort of pull together the remnants and um, make do with what he had, then he was much better. Everything depended on stealth. Complete silence would be essential. Complex artillery plans were drawn up, encrypted, and signaled to focus Allied firepower through the night. Meanwhile, the escape route was carefully plotted. The day leading up to the evacuation had been spent marking out the routes that would be taken. So engineers basically run lines of tape down towards the river bank to allow parties of, of British soldiers and some Poles and them to form up into groups and then follow the, the, the route down to the river. The start of the evacuation was set up for 10 p.m. Urquhart ordered his men to shave and blacken their faces. Boots were wrapped in cloth, rifles taped to prevent rattling. With great tactical skill, the general enacted a classic deception operation. As the escape progressed, he ordered his men to escalate attacks at the perimeter. Artillery from 30 Corps screamed down bang on time. To the enemy, it looked like the start of an offensive. With the Germans on the back foot, the general gradually pulled back his units one by one through the hours of the night, till only a few remained. We were trying through the woods in single file, pouring rain, being guided by the occasional glider pilot. Got to the riverbank, we stopped about 50 meters short. Now Urquhart's operation faced its biggest danger, crossing open water with zero cover. Upstream and downstream, German machine gunners, who could easily destroy a boatload of men in a few moments, only saw darkness in the pouring rain. It was all very gentlemanly. The people who were closer to the riverbank gave way to the men with bandages and the wounded and gave up their places in the boats for them. This carried on until the early hours of the morning. As dawn broke, it was clear that Urquhart had pulled it off. Some 2,400 men had been brought to safety. It was a textbook operation. It's often described as one of the most successful elements of the entire battle. The wounded stay behind with the doctors and the padres who stay with them. Um, but the rest of the defending force largely is able to be extracted. Masterminding this narrowest of narrow escapes would be Urquhart's greatest achievement. And he was rightly praised for it. But some 6,000 of his men ended up as prisoners of war and 1,400 had been killed. In the woods and farms around Arnhem, some men were still hiding out, working with the Dutch resistance, often for months. Among them, Major Tony Hibbert. Evading capture in great personal danger, he set to work organizing some 120 paras on the run and got them all to safety. It won him the military cross. Doug Charlton had escaped with Urquhart. After 10 days of leave, he was summoned back to active duty and went on to fight again with the SAS. As for Roy Urquhart, at first he was hailed as a hero and fame followed. But it would be his last promotion and the memory of his brave but ultimately failed first divisional command would live with him forever. I think he did feel dreadful, but he was a professional soldier. So I, he also said, we took a risk. We were in, a, in the risk business. But I think he probably felt it was a risk too far. And 
he felt dreadful about all those who were killed and wounded. The battle haunted him for the rest of his life.